In this video, I will argue that science depends on philosophy. That is, that the pursuit of knowledge rests on the love of wisdom. This is a controversial idea for some skeptics, who seem to view philosophy as an irrationalist Trojan horse. As a pro-science philosopher, I would like to take this opportunity to both demonstrate the dependence of science on philosophy and to clarify why this state of affairs is not as offensive to reason or science as some seem to think. Proper philosophical practice is a dispute appropriate to the love of wisdom. Specifically, rational, systematic and scholarly dispute about conceptual, empirical and evaluative issues. Dispute is contentious communication wherein there is disagreement over an issue. Dispute is rational when both sides agree to defer to cogent argument in their settlement of that issue. Dispute is systematic when both sides agree on the precise methods deemed suitable to settle the issue. And dispute is scholarly when both sides agree to act in accord with the venerable traditions of the professional student in their efforts to settle the issue. An issue is conceptual when it is to be settled by clarifying the meaning of an idea. An issue is empirical when it is to be settled by some reference to sensory observation. An issue is evaluative when it is to be settled by placing greater value on one thing than on another. Proper scientific practice is a dispute appropriate to the generation of knowledge. Specifically, rational, systematic and scholarly dispute about theories which predict and explain sensory observations. Fundamentally, science is systematic dispute about the merits of competing empirical theories. As practiced today, it is so effective a dispute in terms of the accuracy of the predictions and the quality of the explanations it yields has to deserve a great deal of respect. My argument for the dependence of science on philosophy runs as follows. The first line proposes that there is no situation in which people do science without choosing conceptual and evaluative sides in a dispute. Science as a rational, systematic and scholarly dispute about empirical theories requires that certain ideas like space, time and causation be defined in one way rather than in another. The systematic methods of science also require that greater value be placed on certain approaches to attaining knowledge, like controlled experiment, than on others like appeal to tradition. Thus, science entails and depends upon taking sides in conceptual and evaluative disputes. The second line proposes that there is no situation in which people who do science choose certain conceptual definitions and values over their competitors without engaging in appropriate dispute concerning their choice, but are not prejudiced and hypocritical. Prejudice, literally, because their choice is made before their judgment has been educated by rational, systematic and scholarly engagement in the appropriate dispute. Hypocritical, literally, because they have not tested their choices against the best developed arguments of those who would dispute them. The third line proposes that there is no situation in which people who do science choose certain conceptual definitions and values over their competitors after engaging in the rational, systematic and scholarly dispute about that choice, who have not done philosophy. This is because philosophy is, by the given definition, the appropriately rational, systematic and scholarly dispute regarding such choices. Thus, to pay due attention to one's conceptual and evaluative choices is to do philosophy. The fourth line assumes that there are people who do science. This shouldn't prove too controversial an assumption. 
The fifth line proposes that people who do science have either engaged in proper practice regarding their conceptual and evaluative commitments, or they have not. Which is to say that people who do science have either paid rational, systematic and scholarly attention to the conceptual and evaluative choices that follow from their doing science, or they have not. The sixth line deduces from the first five that people who do science are either both prejudiced and hypocritical, or they do philosophy. Formally, the truth of the first five lines ensures the truth of the claim that at least one of the two claims in this line is true. People who do science choose values and conceptual definitions in order to do so. As line one says, if that choice is made without due diligence, it is prejudiced and hypocritical. As line two says, if it is made with it, philosophy has been done, as line 3 says. Therefore, given, as line 5 says, that due diligence with regard to conceptual and evaluative choices either has or has not been displayed, it follows that people who do science have either done philosophy or are prejudiced and hypocritical. Note that this is not to claim that anyone who does philosophy is free from all prejudice and hypocrisy. That would be great, but is alas, all too evidently not so. The prejudice and hypocrisy in question is only that which follows from the specific conceptual and evaluative choices that the person doing science makes without engaging in the relevant proper practice. The seventh line proposes that people who do science are not prejudiced and hypocritical. Science is, by its essence, a rational, systematic and scholarly discipline one that aspires in an enlightened and progressive spirit to minimise prejudice and hypocrisy. Even if particular scientists are sometimes arrogant enough to proclaim that philosophy has no place in the lab, they can only do so in their ignorance of how philosophy has, during the historical emergence of their discipline, already informed their conceptual and evaluative assumptions. But their ingratitude to those who have saved them from prejudice and hypocrisy does them no credit, but it does not undermine the work done to rescue them from prejudice and hypocrisy. Thus people who do science are not, despite the occasional foolish utterance, prejudiced and hypocritical. The eighth line deduces from lines six and seven that people who do science do philosophy. If, as line six says, people who do science are both prejudiced and hypocritical, or do philosophy, but are, as line 7 says, not prejudiced and hypocritical, then formally they must do philosophy. The ninth line concludes from line 4 and 8 that there is no situation in which people do science without doing philosophy. Given that people do science, as line 4 assumes, and that people who do science do philosophy, as line 8 says, it follows formally that science entails philosophy. Therefore, on the formal conditional, good science depends on philosophy. Firstly, it does not follow from science depending on philosophy that all philosophers are competent scientists. Nor does it follow that philosophy is performed in foundational isolation from science. Science, as done by properly trained scientists, is the best way we have of achieving knowledge. And knowledge is such a potent thing as to be able to affect philosophy to its core. Thus, it is wise to ignore the scientific proposals of self-proclaimed philosophers who are untrained in science, whilst paying keen attention as a bona fide philosopher to scientific findings. Secondly, despite the views of some religious cranks, philosophy is neither a natural nor a historical ally to religious faith. Nor, despite the views of some anti-religious cranks, is it theology in disguise. The godless metaphysical naturalism upon which contemporary natural science rests is, at the very least, as viable a philosophical position as is anything its opponents propose. I hope I have demonstrated that science depends on philosophy, and that to admit this is not, as some fear, to surrender to the dark forces of superstition and irrationalism. 
Thank you for listening.